Uh, welcome, everybody. Um, we have a, a special session uh, at the Jordan Center, uh, which is about the, um, uh, well, the term that's been used here is the Nad Azov Greeks, uh, which is to say the area Azov Sea, and I think it's mainly centered on Mariupol, right? Uh, Mariupol being a special case, and we have someone, a specialist here to speak about it, who is not only from Mariupol, uh, but is also a specialist in, um, well, fluent in English. Uh, but also for a long time now, well before the events that we're talking about, was a specialist in modern Greek, in the modern Greek, um, and working in various capacities, uh, both in collaboration with the Ukrainian government in translation and interpretation, and um, uh, and also is now a professor at the Kiev National Linguistics University. Um, and Mariupol is something special, which we'll be talking about. Our, our guest is Tetiana Lubchenko. I have to always fix my Russian yes. accent, right? Lubchenko, right? Um, and, um, uh, and we're very happy to have her. Um, I can tell you just some of the, the general background, as you all know, Mariupol was basically destroyed in the most recent campaign, uh, the assault by Russia, uh, which created a very um, unusually strong but also coherent diaspora. And the diaspora is partly domestic inside Ukraine itself, but also everywhere I go, I find little pockets of Mariupol. See, um, I don't know what you would say in Ukrainian, but you'd find pockets of people from Mariupol who are organizing in different ways, and in some ways, in coordinated ways, sometimes not, which I find fascinating. I mean, why this diaspora is so particular? Maybe you could talk to us about that as well. Um, but that also could say could wait for the um, the Q and A. Um, so I give the floor to you, and thank you very much for coming. Oh, one more thing. Um, Tatiana lives in, um, in Greece now. Uh, and she's a refugee of that kind. Let's start. Thank you for the invitation. I also want to thank uh, Natalia Karagiergos from professor from Wesleyan University who organized uh, my visiting uh, USA. And I also see uh, on our Zoom meeting that uh, some uh, representatives of uh, Greek society of Ukraine are present. So I, my warm uh, greetings to them. So uh, the topic of our meeting is the war and Ukraine's matters of Greeks. But of course, we don't speak, uh, uh, we won't speak not only about uh, the ongoing war, we will speak about the history of matters of Greek. I'm from Greek family, and I uh, know from my grandparents that uh, if you are of, if you were of origin in Soviet Union, it was forbidden to enter the university. You couldn't find a good job. This is uh, my family. So in uh, 1994, my uh, father received a letter from uh, his grandmother's uh, sister. Uh, she had been writing us for 50 years, and uh, due to the Iron Curtain, uh, we hadn't received these letters. And she wrote us that uh, we are from a family of a famous painter, Archip Puinje, and some of our family members were ex executed. So here you see the Archip Puinje. Some of uh, his uh, paintings were exhibited in the Museum of Mariupol, which was unfortunately destroyed. So according to the census, uh, you see Greeks in the ethnic structure of the Donetsk region rank third in terms of population. Uh, here you see uh, the data from census uh, from Harvard side. It uh, dated 1926, so Greek uh, lived compactly in the eastern part of Ukraine uh, with the highest concentration in modern Donetsk region. We now prefer not to say Donetsk region. We call this area Nadazov region. <laughs> As for Nadazov region, uh, uh, you, uh, you may hear some terms as for Greeks of uh, this region, Nadazov Greeks or Mariupol Greeks or Azov Greek. As uh, uh, you hear uh, on this area, you see this area on the map. And uh, as for this term uh, Azov, Nadazov, it is discussable today because you see on the slide uh, uh, in 1925, 1928, we had the whole scavage orthography in Ukraine. So Ukrainian was used in Ukraine uh, widely. And we see that uh, they use the names Oziv, Oziv, not Azov. 
the pronunciation, uh, the spelling norms were brought close to the Russian language in 1933. And if you mention it, you see that uh, the date coincides, the, this fact coincides with the process of Holodomor in Ukraine. So these are facts that show us that maybe it was uh, planned by uh, uh, Russia. So, as we know, Greeks had been living in the territory of Crimea since the 6th century BC. In 1778, there was a resettlement of Christians from the Crimean Khanate to the territory of Yekaterina Slav Governorate, and later in Mariupol. This resettlement was uh, organized by uh, uh, Suvorov, and um, we see that uh, the July 1778 uh, relocation of Christians from uh, the Crimean Khanate began. Uh, they were led by, by Metropolitan uh, uh, and there were, uh, you see, the total sum of individuals. But uh, sometimes you may heard that uh, we speak uh, about Greeks uh, that came from uh, Mariupol, uh, that from Crimea. But you see that uh, among them there were not Greeks, not only Greeks. Uh, uh, there were Greeks, Armenians, uh, Georgian, uh, um, uh, and Valachs. So, uh, how do we know the exact number of these people? You, you see here the report of Suvorov, list of uh, Christians uh, relocated from Crimea to the Azov region. And a uh, decree of Catherine the Great granted privileges, but over the next few decades, these privileges uh, were revoked. Among of them uh, was exemption from taxes for 10 years, uh, autonomy, etc. And generally positive decree and sincere concern didn't find a response among a Russian official. It was implemented with significant delays, leading to almost two years of wandering for the Greeks in the steps, difficulties in settling new locations, and as a result, loss of lives. You see the number of Greeks, uh, the number of uh, people uh, that uh, came from Crimea, and by January uh, 1779, you see that the num uh, this number decreased a lot. So sometimes uh, uh, you uh, you can hear that uh, uh, Ukrainians uh, came and settled in Mariupol, but uh, uh, we must know that at uh, that place there was a Calmius watchtower at, uh, at the turn of 16th and 17th century. Uh, and uh, also a former Kazakh outpost, Damaha, so Ukrainians lived here. Uh, of course, there were only 75 inhabitants when uh, Mariupol Greeks came there, uh, but still. According to the plan approved personally by Catherine the Great, uh, the territory of Pavlos, the uh, town Pavlos, um, of the uh, district of the Azov province was allocated to Crimean Greeks, and the town of Pavlos was renamed Mariupol. I found some example of courts of arms, you can see them. So the first part of the compound toponym uh, Maria Mariupol is associated with the biblical name of Mother of God, and uh, the second compound is a characteristic of the names of uh, urban settlements uh, here, Greek of uh, etymology polis. And uh, uh, Greeks from uh, that came from Crimea brought icon of the Mother of God and Hydra from Bakhchisarai. And in uh, 2022, uh, a, a photo album was published in Mariupol, the bloody history of the city, uh, the Mother of God. The entire territory of the settlement and the adjacent areas were divided according to a specially developed plan into plots. Over time, all these settlements uh, merged into the common name Mariupol. In addition to Mariupol, within the boundaries of modern Daniel's object, Oblast, uh, Greeks, Georgian, and Blacks, you, hear, you heard that uh, they came all uh, Christians from Crimea, founded 21 villages. So by 1959, uh, 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 by 1859, the territory of this was divided into three parts. Now, I want to mention that uh, uh, they named their settlements uh, uh, such, that, such that they named them in Crimea. So we have in Crimea, for example, Yalta, and we also have uh, Yalta in Nadazov region. And you hear, you say, uh, here you see the name of one of the settlements, Urzu, um, for example. They brought with them some relics, among them the icon Saint George, with scenes from his life. 
the shroud uh, with gold embroidery, the technical method shared with those of Mount Athos, uh, with the red pole and setting, uh, you see. And uh, the icon, I mentioned it, uh, of uh, Bakchisara Mother of War to the 9th, 8th centuries uh, also. So, uh, uh, you, you can uh, find the bibliography, the official historiography of the Russian Empire. Uh, uh, they wrote that uh, initiated of uh, resettlement was the Crimean Christians. And the reasons why they wanted to move from Crimea was the complexity of wartime and oppression from Muslims, fear of revenge from the Turks and Tatars for aiding the Russians in the war, a desire to preserve their nationality, religion, etc. But the most of uh, uh, scientists now uh, say that Crimean Christians were led out of the peninsula and we, um, even we may see about deportation. Uh, the reasons are that the necessity of developing the southern lands, a desire to weaken the economy of Crimea and decrease the harm, and Catherine the Great uh, uh, wanted to, to do a new Greek project which, uh, which aimed at reclaiming and restoring the uh, Byzantine Empire uh, under the protectorate of uh, the Russian Empire. And you see some examples that Shahin Gere informed uh, Romance of in a later dated uh, September 1778, your Excellency assured me that His Imperial Majesty will uh, is to withdraw only those Christians who will agree to it voluntary, but General Suvorov and resident Konstantinov desire, despite this, forced many with threats, saying that they know what they are doing. So. The term Mariupol Greek encompasses two communities, uh, the, the Rome Greeks, uh, which language has five dialects uh, belonging to the uh, uh, Greek branch of the Indo-European Indo languages, and Rooms, who communicate uh, uh, four dialects uh, of the tu Turkic branch uh, of the Altaic language family. Uh, in Crimea, there was an ethnically and linguistically diverse population at that time. Uh, we can find in the bibliography that um, uh, some historians uh, think that the, the ancestors of the Mariupol Greeks arrived in Crimea from the territory of Anatolia. Uh, since languages of Urum and Rume were not used in any official uh, spheres, the linguistic affiliation of the community was not a concern of the authorities, and we can understand uh from the charter granted to uh christians to all christians of the uh greek law who of them were Romain, of who of them were Rulu, but we can understand it by settlements so they settled separate, separately so on uh on the map you see first settlements of nagazov greeks some of them are uh were room slaves some of them were Romain. The pre Crimean and Crimean periods in the ethnic history of the Mariupol Greeks, due to the absence of written sources, so they had, uh, uh, hadn't uh, any of written sources, constituted a great, uh, significant and export issue. You can write some uh, works. I advise you of Margarita Argioni, who writes a lot about uh, um, uh, this Crimean and pre Crimean period. Uh, but but a representative for both groups refer to themselves as Greeks, despite uh, the fact that they speak uh, uh, Urum, Urum speak a uh, language that is from a uh, um, uh, Turkic language family. Uh, they refer themselves as Greek. And uh, it is shown also by investigation of a uh, couple of group of DNA. Um, uh, you can find these results on the site as of Greeks. So the most numerous couple of group is widely spread in the Mediterranean. So we have 38% uh, of uh, this couple of group uh, among the Rome and uh, 25 among the Rum. So they are Greeks. As I said, the, in Nagasov region, they settled separately. Mixed population was only found in Yenisala, its modern village of Velikonovoselivka uh, in Ukraine, I will say, uh, in Ukraine. Uh, but shared religion affiliation of Orthodox Christianity and not tolerant towards Muslims. You see, we have uh, in bibliography a lot of um, uh, signs that uh, prove that fact that uh, they were 
tolerant towards Muslims. So we have uh, um, here I show you some stereotypes, Greeks mm -hmm. and uh, Chebureks, you know, it's a traditional uh, dish of Nagazov uh, Greeks, uh, Chebureks. But uh, you know, the exothnonym Greeks was given to the Hellens by the Romans, and uh, Greeks of uh, Mariupol, not as old Greeks, they uh, uh, do not prefer to refer themselves as Greek. And I heard uh, it in my family, we are not Greeks, we are Hellens. We uh, alien, uh, so in Ukrainian. So, uh, where we can find these uh, uh, terms Romain and or Romain, uh, we can find them, uh, them in works of Carta Haiku, um, investigated uh, and wrote the dictionary of the di dying Greek, unfortunately, dying Greek dialect, and uh, the works of uh, in, uh, Cassandra Castan. And also, I must point that uh, the Carta Hai, uh, who lived in Mariupol, uh, he also spoke Ukrainian, and uh, he was present at the Shechenko funeral and spoke in Ukrainian there, so um, that shows us that uh, in Mariupol, Ukrainian was also widespread. So, Romain, as I said, it's an Indo-European family, the language or dialect of Romain, uh, or Romaica, uh, five sub-dialects we have. We have uh, in uh, bibliography, uh, whether it is Slavic, whether it is English or in modern Greek, uh, we have different uh, terms according to Mariupol Greeks, Mariupol Greek, uh, Mariupol Greek, Tavro Romei dialect, so also in modern Greek, Tavro Romeica, Mariupolitica, etc. Uh, those who are interested, I have uh, this bibliography, I can share uh, it, with, it with you. As for another of room, I must, must point out that there are two groups. Now speaking, uh, when I uh, say Uru, I mean the Mariupol Greeks along with Turkic-speaking Vlachs uh, in Moldova and Georgia who resettled in Crimea to northern Azov. But we have also a group of Uru, those who resettled from Turkey to the Caucasus. Uh, and uh, mm, their language differs and it's an adverse language. So it's other another group which is also called Urum, but we now speak about Nagazo Urums. So uh, the language of Nagazo Urums is influenced by local Tatar, Karaim, Kipchak, and Kus, Turkish, uh, and Nagai uh, uh, languages. Uh, you see the modern classification of Nagazo Urum dialects and some investigations. The sounds of the Rome people recorded in the so-called sound books of Kartakai, you have heard about this investigator dated back to the 19th century. Uh, this collection contains Urum text written in Greek alphabet, but I must point out that among this uh, recorded works is the son of Hizim Hizim. Uh, in the early years of Soviet period, the study of Greek folklore was associated with the name of uh, the Cassandra Kastan. I have already mentioned that this name. Uh, you know, uh, I heard that uh, uh, the Nadazo uh, Greeks, the Romain Nadazo Greeks, they uh, hadn't uh, have uh, written for but he, uh, they had a lot of oral song forms among uh, the, the songs of uh, Leonid, uh, Leonid Yukonabi, Dimyan Babiditsa, etc. And so Cassandra Kassan collected samples of folk creativity and organized uh, the first expeditions. Also in 1920s, the Mariupol Local History Museum was established and also ethnographic expedition to Greek villages were organized. And you see uh, on the screen as of January 2022, the museum had approximately <laughs> Uh, 60,000 exhibits, but now it is totally destroyed. Also, we had uh, some scientific expedition to study the language of Romay that uh, were organized and conducted by scholars from Leningrad. And uh, we see that uh, from the late of 18th century to the early 20th century, some changes occurred in the linguistic situation of uh, Nadazov Greeks. Uh, Greek Kasarevusa, mm -hmm. that it was previously used in church practice, fell off, out of use com completely. And so uh, living in Crimea, both Urum and Rumaic used Urum language uh, in administrative ma uh, matters and uh, some, to some extent uh, as intergroup communication language among Urum and Rumaic. But it lost its prestige. So in 1810, a private elementary school opened under the merchant Popov, where instruction was conducted in Greek. 
Up until 1817, uh, Greek was taught as a subject, but unfortunately, in 1864, uh, it was adopted according uh, to the regulation. Uh, Russian became the language of instruction in schools, and we returned to Greek as a language of instruction only in 1925. It was a, a so called era of linguistic equality. So the early Soviet era of linguistic equality uh, used uh, the demotic, uh, Greek demotic key for uh, as a language of instruction, but there was a problem. It was uh, practically incomprehensive to most Mariupol Greek as it didn't take into account dialectal uh, differences. Uh, and literature was printed in the reform so-called 30 letter of phonetic orthography. You will see now the example I found, uh, you see here the uh, it is uh, edited in, Ma in Mariupol, in Mariupol, 1936. Uh, I found some examples for you. So you see here, uh, those who speak uh, Greek, uh, here this uh, uh, simplified orthography without uh, a lot of E that we have in uh, modern Greek. So uh, initially, Mariupol didn't have its own Greek publishing house, uh, and um, textbooks uh, were brought from Aristophon Don, but they had a lot of uh, Pontic dialect elements. So uh, in early uh, in in the early thirties, uh, with the development of Greek language publishing in the Azov region, Mariupol began to produce its own textbooks and books. So, and I want to share you know, with you uh, one example of translation of uh, a verse of Pablo Pechina. It's a, a, a famous Ukrainian writer. So, uh, here we have a, a son of Pioneer, to Trakuzi to Pioneer. But what is interesting that uh, while translating, I found the original version you see on uh, the right side, the original wor uh, version of uh, this verse. Um, so uh, the translator added some uh, sentences that were absent in the original uh, uh, version. So I will study to become an engineer. I will probably bear the name of Benier. We have this verse, but we don't have it. I will approach work with great attention, and I want to become a linguist like Robert Stalin. So they wanted to show that uh, they agree with the communist regime. Uh, after, uh, after was, sorry, <laughs> those who uh, can read uh, Greek, you see that uh, um, we have uh, simplified orthography as Saho Solit is Ulyamov. So you see. And also, they translated a lot of uh, books dedicated to, you see, the childhood and school years of uh, Ilyich. It's Lenin. <laughs> I don't know. Um, uh, also, for example, Marsha Posta, uh, and the Kipling, uh, some fairy tales, also translated in uh, this simplified version of Dimotiki. Uh, 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 under the names Greeks in the Mariupol district, statistical authorities in the mid uh, 20s have taken into account uh, several separate ethnographic groups, namely proper Greeks, as they said, those who speak Greek, and Tatars, uh, Crimean, also they speak Crimean Tatar. Uh, it was for decision because, you know, uh, the language of foreign people was not pure Crimean Tatar. The dialect preserved Greek, a lot of Greek elements. But despite of the fact, uh, it was decided to use Crimean Tatar as uh, the room people borrowed uh, and uh, um, to denote the language of uh, the Greek or Urum people. So the first founder of the written uh, Romaic language is con uh, considered uh, to be a Greek poet, uh, Georgias Kastaprav. Um, I know uh, it is a, a mysterious fact that uh, he had a birthday yesterday. As you see, he lived only 35 years, and I explained why. The Sartana dialect was used to create the Romaic script. Uh, but he also used, uh, used many elements from other dialects, primarily first native dialect of Mali, Malay Nisoy. In creating the script, he developed a simplified orthography using the Greek alphabet. So here you, he, uh, you see the examples of Agnia Varto that he translated in Romaic dialect. And what is interesting that, you know, um, they use uh, some uh, Ukrainian or Russian words, uh, for example, Stolagir. Uh, we have uh, the Greek word, but 
Sorry, uh, I want to just switch. We have uh, the Greek word for uh, like a camp. It's a camp, but he uses the Russian uh, or Ukrainian one uh, because they didn't have some new words in dialects that uh, they wrote from Crimea. And another example is, for example, from Agnia Barto, Zariadka, morning exercises. During the poet's lifetime, only three collections of his poems were published. Aprutavimata, the first steps, Leontie Kanakbe, Leontis Kanakbeis, Kalimera Zissimo, Hello Life. And um, uh, I want you to to mention this date, uh, 1937, the last uh, publication. Here are the examples. Uh, the young poets primarily wrote their works in the Mala Iniso Sartana dialect of Rumeik, and uh, they were published in different magazines uh, in uh, Mariupol. On October 27, uh, 1930, the first issue of the Greek newspaper Collectivistis was published. And its final issue was received by readers on December 17, 1937, six days after the infamous directive initiating the Greek operation. At the end of the series, Georgios Kastapram, Georgios Kastapram, and most members of his literary group were repressed. And the Romanian literary process was interrupted. You see one of uh, the last uh, 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 magazines, uh, Pioneers, you see the date, November uh, uh, 1937, and we have here Pushkin, uh, translation of Pushkin uh, into Romeika, uh, the deal of gold. Uh, I'm sorry, you mean, you mean they were shot, right? They were, they were, they were executed. Followed, yes, right? yes, yes. yes. Um, and the Greek operation, did you want to say a couple of words about that? Yes, yes, I will say no. You will, perfect, thank yes, you. Yes, 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 I know that it is interesting for audience. So on December 1937, George Kostopran, editor of the newspaper, was arrested by the Mariupol NKVD, and on February 1938, he was executed by the verdict of the NKVD. The Communist Party of Greece, was, which the Stalinist regime has certain plans for expanding influence in the Middle East and South America, was banned and forced into deep underground. In this context, Greeks in the territories of the USSR became dangerous and were labeled as his column. So the Greek operation was initiated by the directive of uh, the Ministry of Foreign Affairs of uh, the USSR. The directive was transmitted via telegrams, and we hear the, uh, see here that uh, Greek intelligence conducting a, a espionage, sabotage, etc. And arrest of Greek in Mariupol occurred from uh, December 1934 to November 1937. Here you, you see the fate of the arrested Greek in Mariupol, a total number only in Mariupol, only in uh, Nadozov region, and uh, the percentage of executed people. So, in the late 30s, there was a shift in the national policy, and from that point, uh, the the groups of Mariupol are not mentioned in archival documents until the late 80s. So that is why it was forbidden to enter the university. That is why uh, the Greek was spoken in families in whispers. And for several years, starting from, you, you understand uh, what the great work did the scientists from Kiev, Andrei Belecki, Petyana Chernyshova, among them a student, uh, uh, Nina Klimenko, which became uh, an academic later who uh, did so many expeditions to this region during the expedition. Uh, many recordings of, of Rumeika folk culture were made. In total, from 1952 to 1977, they uh, done, done a nine field expedition. So, and you understand, uh, at the times, a lot of people, uh, the language of instruction in school was Russian, and they learned Russian. So, uh, the Belinsky, I think, uh, due to that fact, proposed to use alphabet based on Kyrillic speak, because uh, all people can write only in, uh, with Kyrillic letters. See, uh, here you see uh, the alphabet of Belinsky. And uh, some uh, an example of uh, uh, the work of Casta Prague, which was uh, uh, edited in Donetsk in uh, 70, uh, 1977. 
So, uh, since the official Soviet policy at the time didn't allow uh, for a specific manifestation of national cultural identities, um, so writers, uh, Romay writers, prepared self published collection. Here you see that um, we have a translation of Kabzar of Taras Shevchenko, and they have a self published publication, Hierography Ecclesi, in uh, Greek. So, uh, all the publications that were made uh, in this time uh, was rather, uh, were rather an exception and became possible only through the personal efforts of Andrei Belecki. So here we have uh, the photo of some uh, prominent writers of uh, that time. Among them here uh, standing uh, at the right is uh, uh, Dr. Gina, who collected a, a lot of folklore. He died early, unfortunately. So, as you see, uh, all the edition of uh, that time, they use uh, Kyrillic uh, alphabet, the Comto Astro with uh, uh, Kyrillic letters. Uh, the Sun Company Melody released albums to the Son of the Greek of Azov in 1988 and later um, uh, the, uh, the published collection in, uh, also made in uh, Roman, uh, was made in Greece, titled Tamari Politica Travulia um, uh, by Ashla. And thanks to democratic transformation and dependence of Ukraine, rights and interests of the Greek were represented by 95 Greek societies and 21 regions. So we have uh, uh, we have this shift uh, towards uh, the investigation and uh, the possibility of uh, all Greeks of Ukraine to represent their culture. Uh, it, it, the Federation of Greek Societies of Ukraine uh, was organized in 1995. Mm, uh, we restarted the work uh, uh, of uh, uh, the Federation of uh, Greek Societies of Ukraine recently. And we also organized the uh, Society of uh, uh, Ukrainians, uh, Greek uh, of Ukraine, who moved to Greece, uh, which uh, coordinates uh, the work of uh, those Greeks uh, who are relocated to Europe due to, uh, to the war. And now uh, you see the building of uh, the Federation after uh, the, the war had started. And nowadays, unfortunately, we had uh, uh, 48 uh, settlements in Nadazov region, uh, 48 Greek villages, and nowadays 44 are occupied. So we had uh, in uh, uh, Mariupol a lot of uh, all Ukrainian festivals of Greek culture, such as Mega Yurti, uh, international festivals of Greek songs in honor of Tamara Katsi. You heard the um, uh, she sang uh, the the beautiful uh, song for us by Kurtzis Kurtzis. She unfortunately died in, in the accident. Uh, a lot of festivals of folk art of uh, Nadazov Greeks. And a lot of uh, different works, for example, works of Yulia Skutnas as for um, folk takes of Nadazov Greeks translated in uh, Greek, uh, works of uh, Irina Panavaryova, ethnic history of Nadazov Greeks and all other uh, works of uh, this prominent site. Uh, also, uh, in uh, 2019, Poshta issued stamps dedicated to the Greeks of Ukraine. I want to... Um, uh, uh, say that uh, we have a lot of, uh, we have different Greeks of uh, living in Ukraine, not only Nadazov Greeks. So the culture of uh, the Greeks of Mariupol is represented by the architectural monument, the Church of St. Uh, John uh, uh, the Baptist. Uh, the ceremony of making uh, the traditional is the bread psaphir, which symbolizes the crown of Christ made of uh, thorns and crowns and uh, the cross. And um, you, you also see some uh, in elements of decoration. Here we see the hegea periftar and the uh, uh, famous wrestling of Nadazov Greeks, Kuresh. The culture of uh, the Greek of uh, Pontus is represented by the traditional dance Piri Hososera. And also the culture of Greeks of Thrace is uh, represented uh, in the postal stamp cluster. Uh, it was initially designed at, uh, oh, sorry. Uh, as uh, three spinners. And uh, you know why spinning uh, was chosen uh, that uh, 
because Greeks uh, um, used it uh, for all the ancient time and they also brought it to uh, the Mariupol uh, and they didn't want to replicate some uh, um, uh, Ukrainian ones, uh, they brought their own one. Uh, there were a lot of schools and universities where one, modern Greek language was taught, uh, and now is taught. Uh, this Ukrainian educational institution uh, uh, contributed also to the preservation of and development of Greek culture and uh, culture of uh, Nadazo Greeks. Uh, a lot of school and student Olympiads were the nice, but you know, the youth prefer to uh, learn modern uh, Greek, uh, you understand. But um, you see now what happened with the uh, Mariupol State University in March 2022. But we have a, a lot of activists among them Alexander Rybalka and Nikola Arbash who uh, preserve uh, Urum and Rume languages. Here uh, you see uh, at the, left, uh, the right side uh, the example of uh, painting for uh, children with some verses in Urum and uh, Rume language, uh, languages. Uh, these are the works of Ulyana Karceluba. Uh, she also made for us this uh, awesome decoration for our presentation. And also she made some uh, uh, elements uh, which uh, we can use in uh, messages, different social messages as Telegram, etc. in uh, the languages. And in 2020, a project uh, with an album uh, of lullabies and languages of the minorities was launched in Ukraine. Uh, the illustrations for this uh, project uh, were made by uh, children with disabilities. So, also, uh, uh, the movie The Greek of Nalazov region, as Vasily von Rumei, it's the first documentary made in the language of uh, uh, the Greeks of Ukraine, uh, was filmed. I made, I made the English subtitles for this movie, and you can uh, uh, see it uh, December 6, 2023, in New York. So, please come. It was made due to activist, uh, the work of activist Anton Savidi with uh, Suspini Ukraine Television uh, Broadcasting company and uh, now we'll have uh, sensitive content if you want you can uh, pull out uh, uh, we'll speak about ongoing war and we'll have some pictures mm. so here is a Mariupol and the photos of Victor Deda who died uh, in Mariupol 2022 and also you know that Mariupol was uh, a port uh, Roman Verkusha who made this photograph a photographer of Mariupol he also died in Mariupol. And here uh, you will see some photos uh, with some, some uh, uh, that my uh, members of my family wrote while being in Mariupol. You know, a lot of uh, them wrote diaries. Uh, if uh, they thought if they die, someone uh, uh, would find them and would uh, to know their history. So the house is gone, the Russian dropped a bomb. The worst thing is that I no longer have a past, no photos of my family, of my child. I, for example, I don't have any photos of my family now. We drink water from radiators and make bread from all black floor that we found, you know, it was lack of electricity, it was lack of war. There are more and more neighbors' graves in the yard, we bury them ourselves. And all these photos are made in Mariupol. I saw dogs, uh, it's my nephew wrote. I saw dogs dragging a man's leg. Welcome to hell. The Russian buried everyone who was driving in the car in front of us. We couldn't leave. Uh, there was a minefield around. So here is my family, my sister, and the date we uh, reunited in Greece. Here is my son, and all our life in his big backpack, we didn't have uh, any other things with us, and our dog, uh, which he carries. Here is the uh, grandson of my Obgin. Uh, they are on the road from Mariupol, and they took uh, from the shelter a small girl. They, her parents wrote uh, on uh, uh, her hand the telephone number. And we were very lucky that uh, they uh, found uh, her later. Here is uh, Mikola Albash. Uh, you have seen uh, him. Uh, he now fights for Ukraine and was wounded and operated in uh, Romania. 
He writes verses in uh, poems in uh, Romanian language, and one of them is We will back, we will back, we will definitely be back, we will back, it's real, we will back again, we'll feel your sea breeze on our chest, and we will have, uh, we will believe that we will back. Thank you. So, if you have any questions. Thank you very much, uh, Tatiana. I understand that a lot of information I tried. <laughs> Um, well, thank you very much. Uh, and it's a very nice overview. And uh, of course, it's also very confusing because we're dealing with national categories, which we are making, you know, they're mixed at any moment in time. Um, until we finally reach this point where we have this unified sense of Hellenes, right? Yes, yes. Uh, that happens very late, right? Yes, late. Um, yes. But I wanted to ask you more about the, um, um, at the time, with the founding of Mariupol, to the extent that you can go back that far. Yes. Um, so the main unifying category from the point of view of the Russian administration, uh, I, I gather was that they were Christians, right? Or yes, Christians. yes, Greeks. Uh, and the, um, that's what made them Greek, in other words. Yes. Because in terms of language, it could be or could not be, you know, so in a diary. Um, and it was, uh, sorry, it was later than uh, when they divided them into two groups, Romain and Rome. First, they were Greeks. Yeah, yeah. yeah. So, there, so the Russian administration called them Greki. I think. Yes, 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 yes. Um, now, if you look at you know, a little further back with Chmielinski and the um, and the city of uh, Nizhen, um, uh, that was considered a Greek city, uh, but in the, in the beginning, when Chmielinski gave them their privileges, the privileges were for their own, right? Yes, um, yes, yes. And then the Russian administration changed it and it says the Greki, right? And if you look at their names, uh, a lot of them are from Yanina uh, and from the mainland. And their names were very often Vlach and Slav, right? Yes. Uh, but they consider themselves Greek, right? Uh, you know, because there was a language of trade, right? Of uh, that's if you're in the Balkans or in the Black Sea or parts of the Mediterranean, no matter where you came from, you spoke Greek because that's what people use in commerce, right? So uh, <laughs> in this case, so we're dealing with a population which is Christian, but it also speaks Tatar, right? Yes. Uh, originally. Anyway, so that's my first observation. I'm wondering if there's you have thoughts about this. Yes. But yes. I, what I appreciated is that you didn't erase the complexity. You kept it, right? It is complicated. I tried. Yeah. Um, yes, I tried. Yes. Yes. But uh, despite the fact that this book, uh, 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 language uh, with Tur Turkic elements, uh, they refer to themselves as Greeks. We are Greeks. They always say that we are Greeks. Uh, like or, Urums, Urums. I uh, if we speak about Urums. At the time. Yes, at, at the time. And as for last names uh, that you have heard, and some of them you said that uh, you heard that they are Slavic, it may be due to translation. For example, uh, you have seen the letter of uh, uh, my father's uh, grandmother's sister. She is Zalatarjova Kuinja. Uh, Zalatarjova is translation of Kuinja into Russian. <laughs> so some of uh, last names were translated. That is why also you may, uh, we may have some uh, Slavic uh, last names. Um, now today, uh, of the two languages we're dealing with, are they spoken by anybody at home? Uh, by elderly people. Older people. Right? Yes, yes. Um, older people, unfortunately. Mm -hmm. But you will see that uh, a lot of activists are trying uh, to change the situation. And uh, somehow to popularize the use of uh, language of by the youth. Mm -hmm. And the, the Greek uh, government and the Greek cultural organizations encourage the growth of the spoken Greek, right? And yes. The teaching of Greek, but they're teaching demotic Greek, right? Yes. Many yes. mainland. Uh, so uh, uh, I personally teach modern Greek at the university and was uh, the chair of uh, the modern Greek uh, uh, faculty. Uh, but, um, you know, the Greek grammar also helps uh, you. So, for example, uh, these editions of Yulia Putna, uh, it was uh, for um, uh, folk takes of uh, Rome. It was made also with the help of uh, foundation of uh, living distance Cyprus. And also, um, you have seen uh, a work, uh, maybe you have seen, because there are a lot of bibliography. As a scientist, you, you understand that I worked a lot with the bibliography. We have an investigation of of uh, Haider Christo is for uh, uh, dialect of uh, Romani, so some investigations are made for the mm -hmm. help of Greek um, authorities. But is there a movement to also teach the dialects, the local dialects? 
uh, you know, uh, we try and we discuss it and uh, you see some of uh, the activists now try to uh, even make uh, some uh, channels in Telegram, for example, Mikulak uh, Bash, uh, uh, it has a uh, channel in Telegram with a grammar of uh, roommate dialect, mm -hmm. so he tries to, to make, <laughs> he makes some attempts uh, uh, somehow to help uh, all of us to uh, learn better, but the problem is uh, that you've seen that um, uh, Rume has five sub dialects. Mm. Uh, for example, to make some courses, to make to write some books, uh, it is the question which of one we must use. Mm. So there is a problem. Mm. Uh, thank you for the talk. It was so interesting and informative. Um, I was very curious about um, maybe a little bit similar to Naviani's question the way that you described right, so many different dialects and so many, it almost seems like Greek is a meaningless category when we're kind of talking about this yes. Ukraine. Um, but then when we get to the Soviet period, there seems to be some kind of order that's imposed right with these sort of language standardization. Um, and then you talked about this, the Greek operation, which I didn't know much about, and I thought yeah. that's very interesting. Uh, and it seemed that there emerges, and I or guess I'm asking, does there emerge a kind of pan-Greek identity, right? And, and that seems, Sort of popular in the 20th century, you know, we have a yes. pan Arab identity. Um, and the sense that there's a relationship between Greeks in Greece and Greeks in Ukraine. I mean, how there's a sense it seems that there's um, something maybe threatening about Greeks in Ukraine during the Soviet period because of maybe these relationships to communist parties abroad. So I'm wondering if you could talk a little bit more about the way that Greek identity comes to be unified um, over the Soviet period. And then I was also very interested in, in you know, the video you showed of Mariupol, um, right? It's beautiful with the, the city, and then we see the name of the city in Greek as well. Yes. And then it seems that in the contemporary period, there emerges a sense that Mariupol is like a Greek Ukrainian city. Um, so if you could speak about the way that Greekness came to be integrated into a modern Ukrainian identity. Yes, yes, yes. Uh, so, uh, you know, it, it, it is a little bit controversial question about uh, whether it, the language of uh, Rume and the room is language or uh, whether it is dialect. So scientists still discuss, uh, um, you know, the problem is uh, that I mentioned uh, uh, they didn't have uh, written sources and uh, it is uh, um, a little bit problematic due to the lack of material. Uh, uh, we have, um, as for co cooperation with Greece, you know, if we speak about Soviet era period, mm -hmm. uh, there were a lot of uh, priests uh, that came from Greece and uh, um, uh, they taught uh, Greek, you know, <laughs> um, it's a little bit difficult because I must now explain you a lot of theory. If you know, in Greece, of uh, we speak, if we speak about uh, Greek, Greece in, in Greece, yes, uh, there were two types of uh, language, Kasareusa and Dimotiki. Dimotiki was, uh, Kasareusa was official language and Dimotiki was spoken at home. Uh, uh, so these processes of uh, Soviet era period and teaching uh, Greek in uh, Soviet schools coincides with the process of uh, changes from Kasarevusa to Dimatiki in Greece. That is the problem. Mm -hmm. uh, so, um, uh, as you've seen, uh, this Kasarevusa was used by uh, some uh, Greeks. Uh, there are a lot of uh, Greeks uh, who came to uh, uh, Soviet Union uh, uh, before the period the execution started. Uh, and, uh, um, so, and uh, later on, cooperation with Greece uh, were when uh, the, the Ukraine gave, uh, gained independence, mm -hmm. and we, ha we had a lot of cooperation. Uh, so, but despite of the fact that it was forbidden, um, you know, um, for example, my uncle, when uh, he went first time in uh, 1997, uh, uh, if I'm not mistaken, in Greece, he kissed the land. Mm -hmm. He said, I want to kiss the land. Mm -hmm. This is my home. Mm -hmm. And um, nowadays, when we, when the, the war started, when we came to Greece, all, um, or, uh, we didn't say that we uh, came somewhere to Europe. We all said that we came home. Mm -hmm. So there, there were, were always a feeling that uh, Greece is your homeland. Mm -hmm. 
Did all of you take Greek passports? Not all. No? Not all. You could? Mm. We could, yes, yes, yes. So with the independence of Ukraine uh, and uh, with the help of uh, Greek governance, so we, we could uh, help take... Is, that, is it a repatriation law? No, it is not a repatriation law. It's a law for former USSR countries, uh, for people with Greek origin. Mm -hmm. uh, you must pass the exams, of course, uh, to prove that you know language, you know culture, you know history, and uh, become a Greek, to have a Greek citizenship. We have a question on Zoom. Online? Yes. Yeah. We have a Oh, well, we have you have to go by the <laughs> time. Huh? Huh? Where is she? Uh, it's right there. The bottom right hand corner. It's a question in the chat. Message. Yes. Uh, Golfo, we have another Golfo here. You might be interested <laughs> to know. Huh? How has the Nadas of Greek community been received in Greece today? Are you telling your story to Greeks in Greece? How has this story been received in contemporary Greece? Yes, 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 without, you know, um, uh, it was my decision to come to Greece uh, because I know that uh, um, I know Greek more than Greek, so I can tell a lot to uh, people in Greece about ongoing situation. Uh, you know, in Greece, uh, we had uh, uh, a lot of propaganda, a lot of Russian propaganda before the war started. And now uh, I think that... Uh, Things change a lot. A lot of people heard our histories. Um, <laughs> we do a lot of exhibitions. For example, you saw this album uh, for Mariupol. Uh, we made exhibition in Athens. We made exhibition in the islands. We also um, made this exhibition in Chicago here in uh, America. So we tried to, to tell our stories to people and no, uh, I tried also to tell my personal story because it, it is not a, a story of uh, that you uh, read some way in newspapers or heard on uh, some uh, television programs. It's, you know, when people hear some personal stories, uh, they believe. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. They believe and they see the truth. Uh, <laughs> So the, uh, the first Soviet uh, deportation of a nationality were these guys, right? That's where it began. Mm -hmm. And the same way when later on the persecutions of the Jews began, it was a similar logic of a, a fifth uh, column yeah. of a... Uh, um, yes, yes. Mm -hmm. they, uh, they also were uh, the similar pro uh, process with sure. Crimean Tatars yeah. and uh, some Greeks that lived uh, uh, that time in Crimea, mm -hmm. they also were, uh, uh, I know that uh, they sent them to Siberia. Mm -hmm. And despite of the text that uh, in Mariupol, uh, the operation uh, uh, finished with the operation of NKVD, I know from my father, he was born in 1947. In 1948, uh, people came to take him in Siberia and uh, uh, his mother was forced to hide him uh, with some uh, home animals, not to hear that uh, he cries. Mm -hmm. <laughs> <laughs> Unless someone else would. Mm -hmm. uh, just, I, I mean, I think what you're saying about sharing the story is really important because I think, in terms of, in, especially in a Western audience, people think about Ukraine and the destruction that's happening. Sometimes they don't realize the destruction, not just of Ukrainian culture and history, but also this was a very multi ethnic region, right? And continues to be clear from what you're describing. Um, but I was very struck by what you were saying about arriving in Greece and saying that it feels like home. Um, and I guess I wonder if you could speak more about this kind of feeling of home, because um, I'm sure many um, people or maybe families who were raised, right, in Periapol and have this sort of Greek history um, or the methods of Greek history, right, feel maybe a, a sort of more complicated sense of home and identity. Um, and it, I mean, there's other examples we can think of. I'm thinking about like Montreal or like Francophone Montreal, right, like the way that French is spoken there is yes, this yes. sense of being French, but also being Canadian. 
Um, so what do you think about that kind of double? Uh, you know, it's for my personal uh, history. Uh, of course, that fact that I teach Greek uh, helps a lot. I know a lot about uh, Greek culture and history. Mm -hmm. um, but it's uh, for others, I can say that um, after Ukraine gained independence, we have so many contacts with uh, Greece. Mm -hmm. uh, we had a lot of the Federation of Greek Societies of Ukraine organized a lot of uh, projects, a lot of uh, festivals. Mm -hmm. A lot of uh, there were a lot of possibilities for children to come to Greece in summer, and uh, uh, the interesting fact is that that we uh, the federation hadn't divided people into uh, those with Greek nationality and those with Ukrainian nationality or Russian nationality, for example. Uh, children from Mariupol, uh, Russian uh, of Russian origin or of Ukrainian origin. They also had the possibility to come to uh, to Greece in summer. Uh, also, as for um, some project of universities, uh, we had uh, a cooperation of a lot of uh, Greek universities, so you can come for some educational programs. Also. Uh, we were not divided as uh, students uh, uh, to the categories uh, those who have uh, Greek origins and those who are of, of uh, Ukrainian origins. We all had these possibilities to come. And maybe due to the fact that we have a lot of contacts, we organized a lot of festivals, we had uh, Greek theater. I personally participated in uh, um, uh, Greek theater, I played in Iphigenia and Taurus. Uh, <laughs> so, yeah, we did a lot. We have, uh, um, and we still have uh, Greek teachers that come from Greece to teach Greek in Ukraine. Apos uh, in uh, uh, Greek. Uh, so that is why, you know, uh, people who live in Mariupol know uh, about uh, Greece and Greeks. Uh, so uh, many information that I think that even uh, Ukrainian who came to Greece feel Greece like home. Mm. It was a really multicultural and multi-ethnic society, but uh, we all live together. Mm -hmm. All these festivals you saw on uh, this video, that all these festivals were, were organized not only for Greek people, all uh, citizens of uh, Ukraine, all citizens, uh, all who lived in Mariupol participated. So, and there were a lot of them, not one uh, a year, a lot of them, a lot of festivals. So. You live in this society, you hear these songs, Greek songs, a lot of Greek came. And Mariupol also, you see that uh, it was a port. Mm -hmm. And a lot of foreigners came to Mariupol. And uh, in Mariupol, in the late times, as you see, it was tolerant to Muslims, for example, as, uh, as was written in uh, bibliography. It was tolerant to everyone, both to Russians. I, for example, I was a head of uh, uh, all Ukrainian Olympiad in uh, modern Greek and literature. Uh, for uh, school children. And I don't know how it is coincide, but we organized this Olympiad together with the all Ukrainian Olympiad in Russian language. The last Olympiad uh, of uh, Russian language in Ukraine was ignited the day before the war started. So. I mean, also another way to look at your question and looking at your period in history. Uh, uh, uh studies the same region, uh, yes. maybe slightly later. And the um, well, you know, until the establishment of the Greek state, um, in the 1830s, who's to know what home is, right? Mm -hmm. Um, so the establishment of Greece creates a diaspora, right? Mm -hmm. Before the establishment of the Greek state, um, if you lived in you know Bucharest, that could be home, mm -hmm. right? And the and the Peloponnesians could be the foreigners, right? You know, the, the diaspora, you know. Mm -hmm. Could I ask you sort of a sort of a, maybe a, just the beginning of a broader conversation? So, in, in Soviet nationality policy, you had the category of Grek, right? Yes. Official, and the subcategory of Plantiids, Aeolians, yes. and so on. And the Mariupol had their own category. Yes. Yes, what they differ from point of view. In, in, in case of culture, in case of, uh, in terms of culture, in terms of uh, language or dialect, I uh, uh, understand they differ. Uh, what was the name, the official name of that? No, well, you know, in uh, uh, I was born uh, 1978, and that time uh, somehow changed. I don't have in my uh, documents uh, this uh, nationality, Greek yeah. nationality, um, despite of the fact that I was born in the uh, Soviet Union. Mm. But my father 
head. He didn't. He, he, he died, unfortunately. He, he, he had, yes. Uh, and it was written in Greek. We, we hadn't such differentiation. Body Greek, Mariupol Greeks, but uh, we knew that we differ. Mm -hmm. Yes. Are there any difference between Mariupol Greeks and uh, Greeks in Odessa, let's say, or Greeks yes, in Russia? Yes, yes. In different, A different category. Different categories. Uh -huh. I saw by, I just uh, tried, you know, in brief, because a lot of information mm -hmm. to show by steps that we have different categories of uh, Greeks living in Ukraine. Mm -hmm. Now, today in Ukraine, uh, obviously there's, uh, you know, a wide recognition that there's such thing as national minorities. Yes. Inside, the Bulgarians, the Romanians, the uh, the Tatars, the, uh, the Greeks, and so on. Everyone has, and there's a good understanding that in this day and age, Ukraine is open to all of these possibilities. Are they official categories also? Are they officially recognized? Yes, they, they are. are officially recognized as an uh, ethnic minority. Mm -hmm. And you know, Zelensky just uh, signed a new law as for we have uh, uh, those minorities and uh, indigenous people who live in Ukraine also have some um, signs of uh, their settlements in the languages of uh, this. Mm -hmm. Also, we have uh, uh, broadcasting companies, uh, we have uh, television, uh, different channels in the languages for minorities. Unfortunately, not in, uh, in the language of uh, Nabazov Greeks, but we hope in the future we'll have. Uh, are you familiar with an organization called Yamaniu? Uh... Yes, yeah. of course. Are you are you connected with them, or are they a separate organization? Uh, it's a separate organization, but uh, you know, uh, all people that uh, are from Mariupol are to some uh, concern connected. Uh, we try to tell the words uh, what happened in Mariupol, and we all believe that we have the possibility to return mm -hmm. to our hometown. There are a lot of projects. Uh, um, uh, there is also a project with. Uh, uh, uh that uh, video screens uh some it's a, like uh stories of people who survived in mariupol uh, so you also can uh, visit uh, mm -hmm. and only um i two two questions so the um earlier you said that in your family there's a sense of you know like we're i think you said Helen, right like that was, yes yes the term. Helen. is that is that because if um certain groups were categorized as Greek, maybe who were not really seen as more authentically Greek, or is that a sense of being, you know, most authentically Greek? And then um, the other question I had was just about the folk song that you put up uh, earlier, which I thought was wonderful, about the daughter saying, oh, I'm not going to marry a shepherd because he'll do this, right? And I won't marry so-and-so because of this. Yes, yes. And at the end, it said she will marry a drunk, but I didn't see the last <laughs> line. And I yes. wonder if you could just explain why she agrees to marry the I don't know what I'm trying to do. I'm asking you, uh, how will your choice uh, to marry? marry? I mean, she's got an option. We have, yes, we have a little bit of a version of this song. <laughs> with, uh, yeah. uh, <laughs> Uh, so I found one of uh, the versions uh, um, was who she wants to marry, yeah. <laughs> and it looks funny for me also. <laughs> so as for this term Helens and uh, what I heard from my uh, grandparents, I think it's due to the different periods that Greeks came to Crimea firstly, mm -hmm. and due to the names that they uh, brought with them, uh, we have such differentiation. Someone calls themselves we are Helens, someone calls us uh, we are Greeks due to this uh, periodization. Mm -hmm. And as for language differentiation, I think it's also due to the uh, fact that they came from different parts of Greece, you know, the Greece was white in ancient time. Uh, so they came from different countries and uh, they brought different uh, forms of uh, language of that days with them. That is why we have uh, uh, a lot of uh, dialectal uh, differentiation in uh, Nadazov Greek. Thank you. Right. Now, this one comes from David Hawk. Uh, this was an amazingly thorough and sophisticated history of the Nadazov Greeks. Congratulations. Thank you, David. <laughs> Thank you so much. Yeah. David helped uh, me with uh, this translation of the movie. Yeah. Um, so, greetings to <laughs> David. So, it uh, help, helps us a lot with the project. So, so the David day. has, yeah, is that right? Yes. Yeah. So, he continues. I realize that you are uh, trained in linguistics, but there are also, there's also a story behind all of this. Now, that's a Greeks. Now, those of Greeks have been continuously been subjects of empire. Um, 
how does imperialism break and reshape not only communities, but languages as well? And how is this story playing out now? Um, uh, um, I guess you mean under Russian uh, Russian occupation, right? So I would imagine, or, but you can clarify. Yeah. Yes, uh, you know, um, uh, if we speak, uh, if we speak about uh, this uh, uh, in in the period um, when they lived in uh, Russian Empire, it was a, a period when uh, they resettled from Crimea to Mariupol and had a lot of problems uh, because uh, you know the climate of uh, Crimea and the climate of uh, Nadazov steppes differs a lot and uh, they had a lot of difficulties in settlements. So uh, these uh, hundred years they tried to new homes, uh, to build new homes. I don't think that uh, they thought a lot about uh, their culture that time. Uh, next, in the Soviet era period, you understand that before uh, 30s, uh, they had a lot of problems and uh, um, somehow uh, they stopped to develop some uh, something new uh, and tried uh, somehow to survive in uh, the difficult circumstances. Mm -hmm. mm, but as for nowadays, you know, um, it is. Um, uh, I feel so sorry that uh, we did so many to uh, to let uh, this unique culture and uh, this unique uh, dialect languages to survive. And now, because the ongoing war had a lot of difficulties, because uh, as you have seen, uh, almost all Greek uh, villages are under occupation. And uh, people now, they, unfortunately, those who move to Europe or some other parts of Ukraine, independent Ukraine, they now think about uh, how to how to live, how to find new job, and uh, mm -hmm. they don't think a lot about uh, what what we can do uh, in order to. Uh, I think part of what David is asking is um, this is if you know all of these things, these shapings of languages and cultures. Are, are, um, are happening under one or another imperial rule. And part of what you're saying, I think, is that um, up until a certain time, uh, speaking your own dialect and having your own ethnic background were permitted under empires because empires are loose categories, right? Yes. Um, uh, this was interrupted, obviously, in the 1930s, uh, revived again under Ukraine, um, under the independent Ukraine. And I think part of what David is asking now is, What's the fate of this kind of population with the current Russian occupation in, for example, the 44 villages or in Mariupol itself, which uh, whatever population is left there? Yes, you know, I, I must um, I must also admit that um, as for uh, their communication in uh, in the period of Russian Empire, uh, you must understand that uh, they communicated these dialects in families. So the official languages uh, uh, before the Russian Empire came to uh, Crimea, or after the Russian Empire came to Crimea, were different. Uh, uh, whether it was Turkic language, whether it was Russian language, or some others. Mm -hmm. uh, nowadays, you know, um, the problem is uh, that uh, we don't know. Uh, actually, we don't know, and anyone uh, doesn't know how many Greek uh, Greeks, not as all Greeks, left in uh, the occupied area. Mm -hmm. Also. We unfortunately we don't have uh, exact number. Uh, uh, how many of them died? So that is why I I don't know. It, it is mm. difficult to to say uh, um, something about uh, their future. Mm -hmm. But I hope that uh, we will try to do. We we'll now make all of our efforts somehow to connect uh, those people who left Mariupol. Because you know the communication with uh, uh, those who are in Mariupol is difficult, and uh, um, somehow it is dangerous. Mm -hmm. Because you know, if you have uh, uh, communication uh, with uh, people who live in independent Ukraine, or for example, they always check uh, your accounts, Facebook account, etc., and you have uh, some friends with the Ukrainian flags, it, uh, it really was a problem. Maybe a problem. Mm -hmm. Some of my relatives, uh, I don't, you understand, for reasons where, you know, recording, I can't say you 
exactly who, but uh, were caught and uh, were taken to prison for some photos with the Ukrainian flags. Um, are there any more questions online uh, or straight in the room? Uh, yes. Oh, uh, uh, no. um, we spoke about empires, and um, was there a line that said that uh, an imperial instruction or decree or law has prohibited teaching in local dialects in 1860? Is that right? Uh, 18, uh, 1860? No, uh, it was not pro prohibited to teach in local diet. Uh, for some time, they, uh, the language of instruction was Greek. Uh, in that form, you understand, it's not, it not a modern Greek. Uh, the form of Greek that uh, we have, uh, modern Greek that we have now. And for some period, it was Russian. So it was not prohibited to speak uh, in dialects, for example, in families. For a long period uh, in, in Crimea, for a long period during Soviet era, uh, these dialects were, uh, were sacrificed somehow. Uh, there were uh, languages that were spoken in family. But the language of instruction could not be Greek. Uh, it was Greek, it was Greek, but the problem was that uh, all people who knew the dialect, I mean uh, now the language of uh, whether Rume or Rum, they didn't understand. Uh, because it, it has, you maybe you heard from some uh, reclaiming of verses that it differs from modern Greek. You know, as a translator, uh, there, there were a lot of uh, official delegation that visited Mariupol, uh, among them uh, all the presidents of Greece, uh, and they visited also Greek villages, and uh, they saw some uh, uh, Greek theater, uh, uh, I mean Greek theater, Mariupol Greek theater. Uh, so uh, when uh, these de those delegation came from Greece, they always asked me to translate because they didn't understand uh, what they heard. When uh, Greeks from Cyprus came, they understand everything. They understood everything. <laughs> I think uh, that is due to the fact that uh, uh, Cyprus also has its own dialect. It may be the period when uh, Greeks from Cyprus uh, came to Cyprus and Greek from uh, Greece came to Crimea somehow were the same. That is why they understand clearly. Mm -hmm. Yes. Yeah, I don't understand any of it. I, uh, yes, I understand. Do you either? Do you understand? No, no, no. Um, <laughs> I wonder if you can tell us a little bit about that episode when uh, when Mariupol was being destroyed. Yes. And the last diplomat to remain was the Greek consul, right? Yes. Yes. Um, He's now in Kiev. He's what? He is now in Kiev, yes. Yeah. Um, so uh, my understanding was that he was the last diplomat to remain. Yes. And he opened a humanitarian corridor for the last people to escape. Do I have uh, that right or something like that? Yes, yeah. yes. Uh, uh, you know, uh, it, it is difficult. Uh, uh, he did, but it is difficult to call uh, uh, something that happened in Mariupol the time of humanitarian corridor. You know, despite of the facts that Russia knew that it is humanitarian conflict, they bought everything. You know, that was the problem. But yes, he did. Uh, he survived and he helped put, uh, a lot of people that he could that time uh, to survive uh, and to leave Mariupol. Mm -hmm. And now he's, uh, he's working in uh, the embassy of Greece in, uh, uh, in Kyiv and he learned Ukrainian. He learned Ukrainian. He learned Ukrainian. He speaks perfectly. Mm -hmm. I heard him <laughs> two weeks before. Yes. <laughs> he speaks perfectly because those people who were in Mariupol that times, they understand everything, mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. even if they are foreigners. Mm -hmm. There are no some doubts who did it. Those who lived in, who did it, you know, uh, sometimes you may hear it, uh, we don't know exactly who uh, destroyed these uh, buildings. Right. Well, well, yes. That's right. If you were in Mariupol, you don't have doubts. Yeah. You know exactly who did it. I think we can agree with that. I, think, <laughs> I don't think anyone would have it here either, right? Mm -hmm. um, if there, are there any other questions on Sandra? Yeah. Okay. Well, I think we're good. Well, thank you very much for the presentation. Thank you. And if anyone would like to pick her brains uh, while she's here, you're welcome to. We're not leaving immediately. We have a few minutes. Thank you. Thank you.